So I want to thank, I want to start out the evening with thanking our dear, honorable Ambassador Esther Cooper Smith. She is not here with us this evening. Janet Pitt is her proxy, and thank you, Janet, for all your you. interested hard work to put tonight together. Tell Esther, who's upstairs and can't come down at this moment, um, that we miss her. Um, your graciousness and generosity and support of the Institute for Education are just beyond. Now, I want to tell you, you all have to make sure that you check out downstairs. Um, I call it Esther's trophy room. I think it should be in the Smithsonian with all its political memorabilia. Uh, in 1991, Esther hosted Bill Clinton, and just around that time, Joe Biden, too, who in 1991, no one knew who Governor Bill Clinton was or Joe Biden. Um, she hosted them at her house, and it was a very exclusive dinner with media and think tank. Um, Bill Clinton stayed till about 2 a.m. then. <laughs> there were only about 25 people, and this was his, you know, introduction to the Washington sort of movers and shakers and power elite. Uh, I, I, I think tonight we have a few of those coming up people here. We have Anish Chopra, we have John Farmer, um, and I think they'll be visiting Esther uh, through time to um, host, to, to participate in those kind of events, and maybe even to get Esther to do some serious fundraising. <laughs> she is, uh, of course, she was a big Bill Clinton fundraiser, enormous, and um, and now she is a big Hillary fundraiser as as well. So she always keeps her eyes on, on what's coming up um, for people that are the rock stars in public service, as you all are. Um, now, we, we um, I, as I always start out, I always say, welcome sport fans, welcome sport fans to our nonpartisan and always civil on the record Info Public Policy Roundtable. We are in our 23rd season, and IFE Info is a Washington institution, a mainstay in the public policy arena. For over two decades, we have been breaking through partisanship and cutting through politics, bringing leaders together like you all, to establish common ground. And in doing so, we have always been leaning in for the next big thing. And tonight, the Internet of Things, IOT, is what we are going to talk about. Now, for some of you, like me, who a while ago did not know exactly what the Internet of Things is, so who told me? And to make a long story short, basically, it's if you're at a red light, and there's no one else at the red light. That red light will be smart, and it will say to itself, well, turn green and let that person go. I think that is pretty cool. Now, they are all technologists and a little bit above that, but they're going to sort of dumb it down for all of us. <laughs> Thank you to our amazing panel, um, George Clooney. Oops, no, 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 no. You know, I thought I was the original person that did that, but John Stewart did it way before me, I, I, I saw, so I, I'm very sad about that. But uh, uh, Anish Chopra is here, and Jeff, where's Jeff Mulligan? Jeff Mulligan and Dr. Joe Palestra and Do Dr. Sokri Reed. And I tell you, talk about a brain innovation trust here. I mean, this is it. I want to welcome our extraordinary and plenipotentiary ambassadors here, and especially Elena Papadovra of Bulgaria, who has hosted the White House Presidential Innovation yes. uh, Fellows many, many times. Always wonderful to have you here with us. And I want to thank the IFB leadership, um, Jim Valentine, who also is my husband, IFB founder and uh, trustee. Thank you, James. And Dr. Amy Gang, who is the IFB Innovation Fellow. So speaking of innovation, um, you'll all see a number of these people around wearing medals. And just yesterday, they were all decorated at a graduation ceremony that IFE hosted at the Historic Congressional Country Club with IFE's highest honor, and we gave them their, their medals. So I think we have a big applause. Let's give them all a big applause. <laughs> and before John and the panel get all fired up, um, I want you to check out this best sellers we have here. <laughs> now, George Clooney only wishes he wrote this. You know? 
It is a must read. It's a perfect gift. Anish is here um, until about 8.30 or so. So uh, buy one, buy lots. Uh, he'll sign them. They make fabulous gifts. It's a great read. It's not, um, a, it's not a technologist book. I mean, anybody can read it and get all fired up about um, what the United States government is doing about innovation. Uh, now with that, and uh, with compound IFD awesomeness, John Paul Farmer, our Institute for Education Emerging Market founder and IFE steward and a great supporter of the Institute for Education, I will introduce the panelists. And I want to make sure that you all remember that this is a salon, and so the panelists, you know, keep it brief, okay? Audience, feel free to pipe up and comment and challenge. So with that, John. Thank you so much, Coach. Thank you all for being here. I just want to reiterate Coach's welcome. So many fantastic people in the room for this conversation. And then I have to also thank Coach and thank the Institute for Education, the wonderful interns uh, who make this possible. Uh, thank you all so much for everything you do. So we're here to talk about the Internet of Things, which, can we show, show of hands, who has heard the term Internet of Things before tonight? <laughs> and who has not? There we go. Now, there are other terms that people use. They say internet of everything, they say cyber physical systems, they might say machine to machine. Nobody says cyber physical systems. <laughs> These two guys. These two guys. These two guys. Way to the weeds on the inside baseball. They want That's a smarter planet. Yeah, 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 an IBM ad, you might say smarter planet, uh, smarter cities. So. But these are really talking about the same thing. It's talking about uh, devices, embedded sensors in the environment around us, especially the built environment, that help us live better, more efficient, healthier lives. So we're really fortunate to have the folks uh, on this panel to talk about it because each of them knows a whole lot about the topic. And I guess it was about a year and a half ago that uh, Todd Park and I, Todd Park, the USCTO, um, and I were thinking about which projects would make sense for the second round of the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. And we saw a report that had just come out at the time from GE estimating that uh, cyber physical systems, the Internet of Things, could add, I believe the number was 30 trillion? Am I getting this right? I think it was 30 trillion dollars to the global economy before 2030. The numbers are so big, they just sound kind of ridiculous. If they're off by a factor of 10, it's still fantastic. So we started thinking, you know, we should probably look into this and see if uh, part of the government would want to participate in an effort to help make this happen, make it happen faster, better than it would otherwise. So that's how the Cyber Physical Systems Project, which is what's called at NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, came about. And that's what brought our first two panelists here. So without further ado, let me introduce who we have here. And uh, I'll ask you after I introduce you, you can just give a couple minutes uh, about who you are, what you've done, more background than what I'm about to give. So next to me we have Jeff Mulligan out of Colorado Springs, Colorado. So uh, Jeff's been working on the internet since before it was called the internet. And he actually was one of the co-creators of IPv6, which is a next generation standard. And the coolest thing I think I've heard about Jeff is that Vince Cerf, who is widely regarded as the father of the internet, called Jeff the father of the embedded internet. And we actually have third-party verification, so we know this actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeff can tell us a lot more about uh, you were there too. We have two people verifying. <laughs> Sounds really real. So Jeff, take it away and tell us a little about your background. Um, well, so so after graduating from the Air Force Academy, the um, the internet was sort of in its infancy, um, and and so I had a number of, of projects to try to bring the internet to uh, sort of my first phase try to bring innovation in the internet to the US government through the, the, the military. Um, we worked on IPv6, we worked on uh, security and privacy issues associated with it. Um, but then a transition, uh, I started working for large multinationals to see how we could actually bring the internet of things that we didn't call it that, but how we could interconnect devices in your home. How could we make a home not smarter, but more convenient for you to live in? Um, so how could the um, uh, how could your refrigerator um, maybe warn you when you know I open the refrigerator door and I have no idea what went bad in there, but wouldn't it be cool if your refrigerator could actually tell you it's the cheese uh, uh, that's gone bad um, or something else and, and uh, or and this is my favorite one of the things that we worked on was a washing machine that would let you know when the clothes had been washed because invariably my wife says. Honey, would you please take the clothes out of the washer and put them in the dryer? Invariably, there's a sports game on, and I forget. Um, 
we were working on a system that would actually put something up on the screen and say, the clothes are, draw are, the clothes are now done washing and I couldn't watch the game <laughs> until I moved them into the dryer and hit dry. Um, and uh, I thought it was a really, I actually thought, even being a sports fan, I thought it was a sports fan, I thought it was a cool idea, and it didn't quite take off yet. So. Um, but that's part of the idea of what the Internet of Things, things could do. So. Fantastic. So let, let's hear from the, the other half of the uh, the NIST Presidential Innovation Fellows team that's been working on the Internet of Things. So Dr. Sahu Ri uh, has his PhD from MIT. He has uh, worked in, in the private sector uh, starting Internet of Things companies. He successfully sold his company before, uh, before joining the government on his tour of duty. And he was also named by MIT as one of the top innovators of uh, 35 by the Technology Review. So without further ado, Sahu Ri. So um, the, as you pretty much just read my bio, so I don't have a lot to add about it, but I just want to talk about why I thought about even joining the government as president of Of course, that was a cool thing. I mean, it looked like presidential in the title. <laughs> credibility. But at the same time, I spent like almost 15 years in the private sector uh, with my startup and raising funding and all that, work with customers and try to sell the products. And I realized at some point that I am putting all this effort really for me, okay? And then the impact is so narrow. The impact is really a lot of my company. So I thought about, you know, if I spend like years of my life doing, you know, making progress in other things, I want to make a broader impact. And that's really what I got to the President Fellow, and that's what I think, what I, we both worked very hard the last one year. And uh, I'm pretty happy right now that I, I you know, maybe we did, I didn't achieve everything, I didn't accomplish everything, but I kind of yes, you did. <laughs> pushed on the needle a little bit. So, just want to say that that's, that's been uh, an amazing year for us. Thank you, Saku. So, we also have another presidential innovation fellow. This is uh, Dr. Joe Blastry. Now, Joe was not working on the Internet of Things project, he was working on a project really to build a, a Kickstarter, not for money, but for people's time. So that federal government employees, civil servants, could actually collaborate on important projects that might not have been part of their, their official duties. So uh, something that I think is going to benefit everyone in this room, everyone in the city, everyone in this country for a long time to come. And prior to that, and this is why Joe's up here today, it's not just that awesome project, it's that he's a serial entrepreneur. He, uh, he had uh, started, uh, founded an Internet of Things company in the past. And um, prior to that, he got his PhD from Berkeley. He has been named uh, one of Business Week's uh, top innovators, uh, top innovator, uh, innovator under 35, top 40 under 40, Silicon Valley. Whatever the right thing. All of you. He should have <laughs> lots of awards is the, uh, the impression I get. So Joe, you want to tell us a little about uh, your take on the Internet of Things? Yeah, sure. So um, I went to Berkeley and actually was funded through NSF and through DARPA. Um, to do a project called Network Embedded Systems Technology. And uh, the idea was Berkeley created uh, Unix. We're going to claim we created Unix, even though AT&T will claim it. Um, and so we created like the Unix of the embedded internet, uh, you know, for Jeff's world. And uh, as part of that, they said, we really need applications. And so as grad students, we went out and we started monitoring endangered seabirds and figuring out when they would nest and how they would breed and why they would breed in certain places. And, um, we did some defense things around tanks, chasing tanks, we won't talk about that. Um, and, uh, you know, we got Wired Magazine and Scientific American covering all of these very interesting uh, aspects. And so, uh, having previously been at IBM and, and Microsoft, uh, I went out and started a product company. And what was really interesting was I showed up on the first day, I'll fast forward, showed up on the first day of the PIF program and I see Jeff and Saku. And I go, oh, what, what project are you guys working on? And they're like, cyber physical systems. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's really interesting. Because Saku, his company and mine, uh, uh, basically built similar products, but in different spaces. Uh, so we had known each other and run into each other from that. And uh, Jeff had done uh, the IP Smart Objects Alliance. Uh, did I get that right? Some stuff. Close enough. All right. And so it was really cool to like come together uh, that we had been together seven years earlier, six yeah. years earlier, and then come together again as Presidential Innovation Fellows, working on uh, actually very different projects. Um, so I've deployed a whole bunch of sort of Internet of Things systems, and I'm tremendously excited to see things like Nest. Uh, my co-founder from my last company went on to Nest, um, and to see that get acquired by Google and build momentum. Is, uh, and, and Nest, of course, is, is the smart thermostat yes. company. 
um, they got acquired for three point two billion. So mm -hmm. not too shabby. Not too so shabby. Joe, you're rich. No, no not this <laughs> friend. No, my friend. <laughs> my friend. <laughs> Here to the government. Shit. Shit. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Anish Chopra. Anish probably needs no introduction, but I will give a short one anyway. He was, after a career in the private sector, he was the Secretary of Technology for the state of Virginia. He was then the first ever U.S. Chief Technology Officer under President Obama. And most recently, he's an entrepreneur and an author. He has a new book that's out, Hot Off Presses, Innovative State. So you can pick up your copy <coughs> downstairs. Anish, take it away. Thank you. Just a, a couple of minutes to put this in context. Uh, when President Obama in his first year thought about this innovation gap, which is the talent that was emerging in our private sector that hadn't quite uh, found its way to Washington, part of the challenge was to lay, lay out a foundation for what the new economy might look like. The President thought of three things. One, that we recast our definition of infrastructure to include some of this smart infrastructure. I was motivated by this because in Virginia we had a political problem about funding transportation. You could pave another lane on the road, but that would only get you so far. If you could embed more sensors in the road, you could optimize the, the traffic flow and actually achieve a better uh, congestion relief effort. So think of infrastructure now in a smart context, very critical to the President's vision. Second was in many of these regulated sectors of the economy, and energy in particular, and healthcare, uh, the premise was that a lot of these new uh, internet-enabled technologies would have a hard time talking to each other if they're owned and run by different companies. So if there are 10 days in the year when the utility generally says, it's so hot and demand for air conditioning is so widespread, we're going to have to kick it into overdrive to burn even dirtier coal to get the demand met. But if we could send an email or a text message alert to 10% of the people who use energy and say, could you adjust the thermostat a little bit so that you don't need to use as much data? Imagine if that signal could be sent to all the Nest-enabled homes, and instantly the communications can be such that a couple of, oh, I got a text alert, yes, all of a sudden the, uh, my thermostat automatically adjusts. We could, we could, with the President's language, double energy productivity. And then last but certainly not least, uh, in, the, in the notion of the big challenges of our day, rebuilding America's manufacturing base, you know, bending that healthcare cost curve, we've got to find a way to build business models that would incentivize the deployment of these new technologies. And you see that in healthcare today, where uh, now, believe it or not, in the Affordable Care Act, one of the more uh, bipartisan provisions is to uh, move away from paying doctors and hospitals just to take care of us after we're sick but to reward those who think of us proactively and keep us healthier uh, or prevent that illness. And as a result, those health systems are now more interested in paying for some of these monitoring equipment to make sure the slightest hint that your heart's going, uh, we might want to intervene. And you might get that call before you call uh, 911. So these are the elements that I think are critical to realize the full potential of the Internet of Things. Thank you, Anish, and thanks for all the introductions. So let's kick off the discussion with uh, a really hard question, one that's been touched on, but I think is worth spending a little more time on, and that is, what is the Internet of Things? Open question. Well, I think I sort of mentioned, you know, it's, it's, it, it could be considered your washing machine making sure that you don't leave the clothes in the dryer too long, or as Coach was talking about, the, uh, a car, I mean, it, it's a, a car talking to street lights. It, it's all of these. It, it's all of these pieces. It's devices talking to each other across the internet. The internet that we know today is really it was de, it was designed and invented for um, people to talk to other people to communicate. Um, it really wasn't it wasn't for YouTube. Um, I, it really was for electronic mail and, and transferring files so that scientists in various uh, um, across the country could exchange information. Um, but it, it, and it's, it's, it's evolved into people talking to other people. The Internet of Things now is moving to the, um, an age of machines <coughs> talking to other people. You called it that, John. You said machine, machine. <coughs> machines and devices talking directly to each other. So now we can all look forward to our refrigerator posting YouTube videos. No, I'm kidding. But. <laughs> so just looking at it from a technical perspective, it's all about sensors. Why do they spread all over the place in the buildings or is the streets? And collect data and then put that into like cloud system if your cloud system is like a bunch of data 
and do analysis of those data and extract useful information. For example, like traffic in the 18th F street is usually crowded right now, so we're going to revolve the. However, that's a very technical term. At the end of the day, what it's going to do for our life, that's really much more important factor. Connecting devices is one thing, but at the end of the day, you got to do something. You cannot just connect and my so this great connectivity. I can talk to my sensor about there. At the end of the day, it has to do, uh, provide real benefits. And that benefit part is actually missing right now in IoT industry. Everybody is putting effort in investment, try to connect the devices without really fully understanding. They don't have to fully understand without really thinking about why they're connecting devices. So Saku, can you talk some more about that, the, the impact on real people's lives? And we talk about the cheese going bad in the fridge, which is wonderful, right. but does it go beyond that? But at, at the end of the day, that's a great example of, say, you know, yesterday there was, I think a few days ago, there was an uh, article in one of the magazines I read that said, once the beauty of the IoT is once you get up in the morning, and music we're going to play, because we're going to know that you are up. And the shower was going to automatically adjust the temperature of that, and that the TV is going to turn on CBS uh, morning news or whatever. I say, that's a great scenario, but at the end of the day, if that's what people have in their mind of IoT, that's not correct. It has to be about saving lives. It has to be about creating more businesses and creating more jobs and improving the economy. Without, without having that real impact in mind, Having a convenience of adjusting the temperature of the water a little bit is correct. But so a shameless a plug. Lot you can do more, you can do a lot. If, if I can, shameless to jump in. Sakwa and I just finished our Presidential Innovation Fellows project. It was called Smart America. Um, it was a Smart America Challenge. We, we went out to corporations, universities, and the US government, and we challenged them <coughs> to come together. There's been a, a lot of research in, in each specific sector area. So healthcare is doing their thing. Transportation is doing their thing. Energy is doing theirs. But they weren't talking to each other. They said, oh, those healthcare guys, they don't understand our needs. And what we did was, using the power of the White House, we brought them all together and said, can you guys cooperate? Can you find some commonality? Don't find the differences, find the things together. And thus, in December, we launched the Smart America Challenge. Um, uh, we just had our expo last week. We had about 1,200 people show up, 24 teams and over 100 corporations brought together projects. And you asked, and I'll, and I'll show up in a second, you asked how does it touch lives. One of the projects is so cool, it's called Scale. It's happening right up in, in Montgomery County. They have a project where they replace smoke detectors in, in low-income elderly homes. Why? They found out that people are dying just because their smoke detectors aren't working or they're not changing the batteries. So they thought this would be a good community thing to do. We talked with them about replacing those smoke detectors with ones that have sensors in them. The sensors would then monitor and say, is someone getting up? Are they thriving? Are they moving as they normally would? Um, they take the data, as Saku was talking about, the sensors would take the data and shove it up into the cloud. We've all heard of IBM Watson, right, at One Jeopardy. Um, uh, well, they, they push the data into Watson. Why do they do that? Well, because you don't want to give Bob a heart attack because he just was sleeping late that afternoon. You want to understand what is normal movement in his home. But if it's not normal, you would like to send someone in. And, and I, I tell the story, um, my wife's um, uncle had passed away a few months earlier. Um, she was home alone. She fell on the floor. No one found her, and she laid there for three days and passed away. That, right? That's not an experience any family should ever have. And technology like this, it's not expensive. It, it's possible to do, and Montgomery County is showing that it can be done. And now what's really cool is other communities have seen this and said, hey, we want to do that. And that's what and, and that's what Smart America was about, showing how these things could be done, how they can be deployed today. So I wanted to sort of add on, we both talked about the cloud um, and a bunch of cool apps like that as well. Um, it, people here know what the cloud is sort of vaguely. It's like up in somewhere and does all this compute stuff. Yeah. So holds your email, <laughs> you know, yeah. and technical about it. Um, and but so, I think a lot of people have, you know, interest in the security of the cloud too. Uh, sure. And um, so, so what's happening, I think, with Internet of Things is actually, um, from a tech side, computing is moving to the edges. 
and it's enabling things that weren't possible before. So you have these, everybody has like an iPhone or an Android phone or something, right? Those are all part of the Internet of Things, and you don't even really realize it. But that is the ability, you know, your iPhone actually is built into it, the ability to talk to other iPhones without talking to your cellular provider, right? And this starts to enable things. We did a project with the San Francisco Fire Department where firefighters could communicate digitally their information about where they were in a bur burning building without speaking. They could communicate how much air they had, right? This type of application wasn't possible before we enabled computing to go to the edge. And so I think Cisco is now calling it the fog. That's like their new term for it. <laughs> um, you know, so, uh, but I, it, it enables like all of these applications like, oh, I know somebody that, that fell down or um, we actually did, uh, you're getting into cross-disciplinary teams and um, the state of California has invested $200 million in what's called the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society, or Citrus. Um, <laughs> and through that project, um, we actually went out and monitored the Redwoods. And we got scientists data about the Redwoods that they had never seen before. And the data that we found was that Redwoods actually perspire or absorb water based on how much fog is around them. And they do this in order to control their environment, which essentially enables uh, the health of that Redwood group. And so when you start to clear cut around the forest next to the redwoods, they're unable to control their environment. Anymore. And that's data that we couldn't get really any other way at that density that we were able to do through putting, um, you know, computing out onto the trees themselves. So I think of it as like moving computing out so that everything is part of the cloud, not just Google and Amazon and things like that. Fascinating. Nish, let's, let's pull you in. So in your book, in United State, you spend a lot of time talking about government as an enabler what government can do to move things forward in the private sector. Uh, what's your perspective on the role of government in the Internet of Things, whether that's funding or other means of support? So I think there's three roles, and they tie a little bit to the framework uh, I outlined earlier, which is traditionally, when you think of infrastructure, the government has been a funder of it. And in this context, it's really the research and development to enable more of this activity. If you trace back, there are about a dozen billion dollar sectors of the information technology economy, you know, servers, there are all these different sub-components that have their origins in R&D funded by the federal government, including famously Google and others. So that's one. Uh, two, rules of the road. The most jarring meeting I had, uh, of one of the committees the president convenes is called PCAST. It's his Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. And uh, Eric Schmidt, uh, chairman of Google, and uh, Shirley Ann Jackson, then uh, president of uh, Rensselaer Tech, convened a conversation uh, with many of the top 3,535 the MIT researchers. And a gentleman in the context of Internet of Things said, I can kill anyone with a pacemaker. Pause. Turns out that these companies that implant these defibrillators in your uh, body they, rem they work on a remote signal that if you're having a heart attack, the good of it is that they can essentially uh, uh, sting your heart or, or give you a little bit of a jolt so that it gets your heart moving again. <coughs> this professor <coughs> hacked one of these systems in the lab and proved that a fake command could be sent such that a super powerful version of the signal could be dispatched and the shock could have been such that it actually triggers a heart attack and a taxi, which gets to the second role of government, security and privacy standards. So we're not going to wait for some bureau of a department to sort of promulgate, you know, these are the security tablets thou shalt adopt, because that's not the American way. <coughs> but the federal government has a role of convening. Uh, I, I, re I referenced that this is Secretary Hoover's vision when he was Commerce Secretary. He called it the vision of an associative state that allows uh, basically industry groups to come together to say what are the right standards, uh, pre-competitive in many cases, R&D activities that would allow us to address this issue. So no one company that's building these implantable devices, these Internet of Things, uh, might have the wherewithal to fund the security protocols, but a group of them might collaborate with a federal agency to say how can we do this so that the messaging is more safely and securely delivered. So that's the second role, John, is convening around these standards for privacy and security. I mean, the privacy implications are pretty astounding if you don't want people to know that 
your movement in the house is, you know, a certain way on certain days and another. You know, when the mistress shows up, you act one way, and then, you know, the, the privacy issues are pretty serious. Uh, so uh, the, the, then the third piece, John, is uh, we might proactively want more productivity in sectors of the economy that desperately need it, health, energy, and education. And here, we might want to proactively move the industry together to say, we are wasting 10 to 15 percent of our energy usage today. And as part of our vision towards climate change, we want to, ex long before you determine what the supply of energy should be, renewable or coal, uh, let's use the energy we need and not what we don't. And so how do we convene buildings owners? You know, the big shock to me was the LEED standard had been the, oh, every building should be LEED, it's energy efficient, it's great, but without the Internet of Things, there hadn't been that feedback loop to demonstrate that the designs demonstrated savings. And in fact, early studies suggest that they didn't. So now, if we could get these buildings to talk after they're built, they can help the designers. So this third role, John, is like this uber uh, catalyzer of, of, of breakthroughs to try to make big inroads on energy productivity, on healthcare, uh, moving towards uh, you know, kind of keeping healthier lives. And with Dr. Cantor in the room, learning personalized learning so that every child can reach their fullest potential. Those are the roles that I see as we, we kind of think about the potential of Internet of Things and the risks. Absolutely. I think mean, feedback loops are incredibly powerful and we're now able to create feedback loops in places that didn't exist before. We'll talk about feedback loops. Feedback now loops? Knows what a feedback loop is. Certainly. So, uh, so I think um, it's a lot, in a lot of ways what Anish was talking about where we, we do things like you might design a building and we, we're doing it because we believe, we have a hypothesis that that design will be good. It might be more energy efficient. And then if we're not actually collecting data on the reality, we don't know. And then what's really powerful is not just collecting the data and going, yes, it worked, and no, it didn't work. It's then taking that information back and adjusting and improving the next iteration based on the real world. So um, Coach has a great example of yeah. how feedback can be implemented. And there's this is a little bit different between cyber physical systems and you know things. And Coach, you can you can explain that. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> she can she can go ahead. Uh, well, well one of the things one of the things that I'll just point out is that having worked in, in the government in OSTP, the Office of Science Technology Policy, and having that perspective on these issues, working closely with Jeff and Saku and Joe. Uh, and Anish back when, when he was uh, USCTO. It was fantastic to learn about the role that government can play, and then having transitioned into the private sector, now at Microsoft, and understanding the work that's being done in the private sector at these companies uh, in terms of empowering a cloud that is safer, more secure, that has rules of the road to respect people's privacy. Um, it really is a cross-sector <coughs> collaboration. It's, it's the academics, it's the nonprofits, it's the startups, it's the big companies, it's the governments coming together uh, to make this progress possible. And I'd love to hear the perspective that you guys have, having worked on this issue and having worked to convene people across sectors of society, uh, what you've seen in that respect. Well, just so that everyone, the feedback loops really quick, right? Um, uh, we all have feedback loops. You get your, you get your um, uh, utility bill at the end of the month and you yell at the kids, quit leaving the refrigerator <laughs> open, right? That's a feedback loop. Unfortunately, it's really slow. Um, same thing with, with buildings. We build a building, and it takes months or years to get some feedback on it. The Internet of Things, we can reduce that time so the feedback loop is a little faster, and you can see, you can call the kids immediately while you're at work, quit leaving the refrigerator door open, um, uh, or whatever it happens to be. We can, we can, we can be much more um, responsive to these things. We can be more responsive for cars, cars or for traffic, more real time, exactly, John. Um, and so then, to exactly what Anish said is, is perfect on, on what we did for Smart America. It, it was the government, it was amazing. We did not offer companies a million dollar prize to go off and build something, and yet they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to participate in Smart America. All we could do at the end of the month, in fact, John stood up in, and, uh, um, uh, at, at the, uh, in December when we said this, John stood up in front of everybody and said, if you build something amazing, we will shine a national spotlight on it. And that was enough to motivate them to break down the competitive barriers and, um, what do we call, uh, uh, co-opetition 
um, uh, where they would cooperate and then still sort of, in a sense, compete with the other teams to get to get visibility or whatever. And it it it, was, it, it worked amazingly <coughs> well. We have companies that hadn't worked together before, or um, groups of, of researchers. Researchers are very protective, right? Publish or perish. Um, a joke can probably attest to that. Um, and and so the idea was, but that we had researchers who came together and said, I can take. You've got. Um, search and rescue dogs, sensor-enabled search and rescue dogs. I have UAVs, um, um, uh, aerial vehicles, unmanned area, aerial vehicles, and someone else has robots. They combine those together to create something called the Smart Emergency Response System, which is augments first responders. The idea is you can send dogs out to find survivors of a natural disaster. The dogs then use sensors to locate where they are. They can find other things that happen to be um, uh, potential um, uh, problems in the area. The where people and other vehicles came. You were there. In. You yeah. saw this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super um, cool. Where where people couldn't necessarily get into quick enough. The dogs can. The dogs then feed this back across this uh, UAV network. <coughs> And then they take that and, and use robots to go out and move rubble or extract survivors from, from the situation. This didn't exist until Smart America said, hey, we're interested in this, and they all came together to try to build it. So John, actually you hit a very important point. Collaboration among big corporations, small startups, universities, and corporate agencies. Internal things is unique in the sense that not one single piece can deliver a solution. You have to essentially put more and more things together, and the more you put things together, it, the power of the solution becomes much greater. In that sense, big corporations as what they do best. They do, they invest tons of money, they look at the big picture, great. But they don't have to look at the small pieces that needs to be put in to the whole solution. That's what small startups, university researchers, and in some, some points, government agents can also do. So, in, in terms of things, it's extremely important that have some kind of framework that all these different players can come together and work together. And that's kind of unique with Google. And can I touch on one other thing that Anish said that was, I think, brilliant, um, of course. Um, and, and that is, is where the government can also help, um, uh, is, is understanding where policy changes can, can benefit. Um, things like our cars communicating with each other. Well, there's there are all sorts of bandwidth and, and spectrum issues that the FCC needs to deal with. Well, <coughs> corporations can't corporations can't fix that. The government can. There are issues with things like I mentioned scale um, up in Montgomery County. One of the things that is terrifying them is what if they put this in and it doesn't happen to save someone's life? <coughs> Have they just opened themselves up for amazing litigation issues? Uh, what could the government, what, what's possible to allow people to experiment with these things without opening themselves up to litigation where we are trying to, or privacy, yeah. um, is a whole other issue. So I think that's a fantastic transition into a question I'd like to pose to Joe, because I, I think you're one of the folks who might be a little more skeptical than, than others about uh, what has been happening, what's currently happening in Internet of Things, and it might come from some of your experiences having been an entrepreneur in the space. We'd love to hear maybe uh, some perspective on what isn't working currently. <laughs> we'll try to make it a bit more positive. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so it's really interesting. I went back and looked into, when I was doing my PhD, where did this all come from? And it turns out that DARPA funded the wireless packet radio network in the, 19, the early 1960s. So we've had wireless sensor nodes talking to each other since the 1960s. Um, I got to tour the CIA museum and I saw all of the great things they had during the uh, Vietnam War and the Korean, actually not the Korean War, just the Vietnam War, and post that, which is they would actually create like um, artificial tiger dung that would detect vehicles moving by and then they'd fly planes over which would upload the data and figure out where the true movements had been. And this was in the 60s, right? So, so the Internet of Things is not actually a new concept, um, in my opinion. Uh, and if you, go, if you get a chance to go to the CIA museum, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, and I highly recommend it. But uh, so, having done that, you know, in 2005, the Economist came out with a special feature. They took the whole the whole uh, uh, magazine uh, up with the Internet of Things and how it was imminent. And we're now sort of nine years later. And I think part of the challenge, uh, of course, technology has improved. Everybody has Wi-Fi now. Everybody has Bluetooth. 
Um, cell phones have increased production of sensors, so they're a lot cheaper. Um, and all that stuff is good, but it, what it, I've sort of realized is the market is very fragmented. Each of these applications exists in very specific uh, niche markets. And so you need to find, for a big company to get involved, for example, for an IBM to get involved, they either have to get involved and solve the whole thing, or they have to find a market that they can you know, directly make and push and make hundreds of millions of dollars on. So I think um, what has happened is, uh, in the last few years, it's very encouraging, is a lot of the focus on user-centered design. And so asking people what they want before you actually go out and build something and continually revising it. Generally a good strategy. Generally a good strategy. Um, and so I think Nest is a great example of this, the smart thermostat. Uh, you know, what people realized was I can set my thermostat back and forth and back and forth and it'll just figure out what I'm doing. And then I don't have to program it. So has anybody here actually programmed their thermostat at home? Yeah, I yeah. figure you have. Um, most people have, almost everybody has a programmable thermostat, but nobody programs it. And so I think it's this evolution of like making it easier, making the market um, sort of broader than it is. Nest, their, their mission wasn't to sell thermostats, it was to sell thermostats and smoke detectors and take everything that you hated dealing with in your home, your washing machine, um, and make it smarter and more logical and learn from you. So um, I think it's that evolution of the market, and we still may be a number of years out from that market really hitting. Um, but we're on, you can see the progress that's being made. I think this has been a fantastic conversation. I'd like to open it up for questions in one moment, but before we do, let's pass it on to Anish to maybe put, put this conversation in perspective. He's got a really unique um, background, having been in so many different levels of government as well as the private sector. So if you listen to these stories and you're thinking, America's got a great decade ahead, we're going to commercialize a lot of this, lead the world, create jobs, solve problems, uh, why haven't we, and I think, or why haven't we yet taken full advantage? Um, I, I took a lot of my time, uh, especially in the book, but in the context of, of, of my, uh, my tenure for the president, figuring out what do we not do? What should we avoid to make sure that we don't um, miss out on the opportunity? And it hit me, we didn't want to be Kodak. In the 70s and 80s, Kodak had a 90 plus percent market share on film invents the VCR, but doesn't believe the American people will pay $500 for the device. Invents digital photography, but believes it's too um, competitive with its core film business, chose not to invest to facilitate its uh, eventual market uh, success. One of the more awkward moments was when the, you know, the First Lady's guest box is kind of a big deal for the State of the Union. So in 2012, we invited uh, the co-founder of Instagram, which shamelessly borrows the imagery of the Kodak Instagram uh, Instamatic uh, camera, uh, the year of his ascendancy, a Brazilian immigrant, maybe 10, 20 people on payroll, sells this for a billion dollars to Facebook in and the you same year. Tell what Instagram is. Instagram is a, is a service on your phone that basically allows you to take pictures and apply software driven filters to make them look the way you'd like them to look and share them with your friends and then you can follow and monitor uh, all kinds of things that one of my favorites is you can follow all the coolest NBA dunks and so you can do search just for the coolest dunks and you can see kind of an Instagram run of all the, all the cool pictures of the dunks. So anyone can discover the, these kinds of interesting things. But I bring this up because in the same year this is happening, Kodak of course files for bankruptcy. The key lesson learned was that what you can do to avoid these problems is that you establish what's referred to as an innovation pipeline. You manage the innovation pipeline. And what the, when you describe DARPA funding these programs, it's because DARPA had a view about R&D had a direct application to the battlefield, and they were able to bring those ideas to test them, to validate them, and then they had the authority to scale. When Dr. Cantor was at the Department of Education, she might be able to fund tests, she might even have the R&D to validate, to demonstrate that they had effectiveness, but you couldn't with a wave of a magic wand mandate that every higher ed or K-12 school adopt or scale up these initiatives. So we struggle in the broader economy, in health, and energy, and education, where we've got this complicated mosaic around how do you bring ideas to scale. And I think the big challenge of our 
decade will be not only to encourage more R&D to see the potential for things like the rescue dogs, but then to understand on the front end how might a rescue dog public safety application actually be validated that it made it more productive than the current system, and then to scale it to the firefighters and the public safety professionals throughout the country. And if you don't ask those questions on the front end of some of these possibilities, then you're not going to see the benefits. You're just going to say two years from now, wasn't that a great story? And not actually see it have its full impact. So John, my, my conclusion tonight is to acknowledge that there's a, a, a bolus of activity that these three gentlemen have talked about that is phenomenally exciting. I hope all of you would say, gosh, this looks like it's got potential. But that what the question we should be asking ourselves is how can we uh, validate and then ultimately scale the best of those ideas? And that's the policy challenge of our day. Well, I think, uh, I hope everyone here has learned a lot about the Internet things so far. Uh, I think, Anish, you just gave us a topic for the next panel discussion around mm -hmm. innovation culture and how to scale innovation. Mm -hmm. Very important issue. But why don't, we, uh, why don't we take some questions? Coach, do you want to yeah. handle the Q&A? Justice Breyer. I wonder, I have a slightly downer comment and some questions that are designed to overcome the downer. Uh, I've heard a lot of this before. Uh, in 1970, with Paul McAvoy, I, I wrote a book in which uh, uh, there was something called time of day pricing. Yes. Okay. Amen. Uh, until 30 years later, it didn't happen. You didn't need the internet for it, and it would have given people terrific incentives. Just to, they had it in France. They used Schlumberger technology. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we didn't is the electricity companies are regulated by 50 different agencies. They all have their own interests. Uh, the the, the uh, public didn't have that much, so different, different advocacy groups did. Had a lot of influence, but their agendas were different, okay? It never happened here. So you say, well, it happened with York, and maybe, maybe. Uh, uh, all right, let's try, uh, I can give you five of those, you know. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, we have a system, it's called the competitive market system. And by that system, tens of thousands, perhaps millions of companies have direct economic incentives to find out what people want and to try to give it to them. And the theory of the system is let them try to find out. And 42% will fail and go bankrupt. That's okay. Uh, we've known this since Trump Baker, okay? And what's wrong with that? And where doesn't it work? Now, Abraham Lincoln told us it doesn't work with roads. All right, so we learned it doesn't work with roads. And it doesn't work with certain kinds of infrastructure, which governments are in the habit of giving. So now, have you made a new part, which is we have more infrastructure than we thought, it's education, etc. Okay, good. Big plus. But that's not uh, uh, getting somebody to turn down time of day metering. That may be or some other thing. All right. Second, which is more upper. From what you say, it sounds to me as if you were right on the edge, but not quite there. You say the next section, uh, session of something that I personally think is important. Uh, look, I would love to see the so first part. You don't know what I need. And what's interesting is I don't know. And everybody in the government has different needs, but they don't know enough about the computer thing to know. And the people who do the computers don't know enough about what they do every day to know where it works. The model? Frank Gehrig, before he designed the building in Los Angeles, he sat with the orchestra for eight months. And his object was to see what their job is actually like. So is there somebody over in the White House who will come and sit with me? He'll discover I can't even use this cell phone because the security people are so bananas. <laughs> and they said, oh, oh, we'll just tell them to stop. Just tell them to stop. Why is Washington turned into a John Maiden movie from Mars with green hitching folks? All right? It's because they, there's bureaucratic influence. And it's all over the place. And it's because sometimes they're right. All right now, not much that you've said has much to do with that. And that was but I think you're thinking it. <laughs> yeah. That was the upper? <laughs> that was the upper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is an upper. And there's one other thing, is how do you overcome the institutional barriers? Look, I would love, and so would Sandra O'Connor, and so would Tony Kennedy, and so would everybody in public life, to get a system such that civics is restored to 12th grade education in yes, high school. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. amazing. With the internet, we could connect every presidential library with Constitution Center in, in Philadelphia yes, and have all kinds of things going with the Kennedy stuff up in Boston, all kinds of stuff going all the time.
and people can make the films. Annenberg has 50, in 55,000 classrooms. Uh, we have uh, uh, Carnegie uh, that is interested. And next year, there is the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. I have a little free time, not much. So I say, here the ABA, why don't they get President Obama? Uh, with, the, what's his name, uh, Rudenstein, who has a copy of the Magna Carta. One of the yes. Right. Yes. And why don't they go on television, and why don't they say, and have with them 10 films that will in fact show the evolution of our civil liberties? Now, you would have thought that the bar associations could have promoted that. And maybe they are. But I haven't seen the films made yet, and I don't have time to make films. All right? So what I suspect is happening is there are institutional barriers. And part of that is caused by the unfortunate thing about human nature. People love to see themselves on television. And that will come out first. And then how we teach the children is something separate. All right, but that, that, that isn't a little cynical, but not. You see, my problem, every institution has tunnel vision. So when I listen to you, my upper is I think this is great. You people know about this. Now, can you create a situation where those of us who are in government will be in the future? I've been in the past. You have a way in a world of really limited time. I can't work more than four devices every month. Because I don't have to get mixed up. Okay? In that world, you will tell me what I need, and then you will help me break down the institutional barriers that will put the Congress, the presidency, and the courts into 55,000, no, 550,000, 55,000 school districts across the country. Can you do that? If you can do that, you should have 10 more sessions about how you can possibly bring this about. So may I, uh, if I may, this is wonderful commentary. And, and let me begin by the lessons I drew from Kodak and the implications on how it, it addresses the, the specifics you, you raised. What we top-down systems where an institution de determines what it wants to see innovation to be. If you're in the Secretary of Defense, you have a point of view, it is an institution. When I talked about education and healthcare and energy, these are multi-institutional, multi-stakeholder. So the, the glue we thought was to borrow a page uh, from a professor at Berkeley, Henry Chesborough, on open innovation. So here was the logic. Let's take your first point about time of day pricing. Uh, I, made a, I made one phone call to the chief information officer for Pacific Gas and Electric. And I asked her, I said, look, I'm getting beat up by all the Googles and Microsofts saying you're not letting their cool apps play with the energy data because they have already tariff rates, but you're not letting the data be released such that they can come up with a cool alert reminder like bother your TV set to remind you that you should turn off the, 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 the air conditioning. So we've made the policy framework around every individual should be entitled to an electronic copy of his or her own data. That, that was the principle. And if we standardized how that worked, then that could create an opening for all kinds of innovations. So she asked very thoughtfully, well, let's get smart folks around the table agree. Within a month, her three major CIO friends from SoCal Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric convened. There were more lawyers in the room than the engineers because they're all scared what's the government doing here. And within 90 days, they had agreed to open up their energy consumption data back to the user. They wouldn't give it to Google, or they wouldn't give it to Microsoft directly, but they would give it to the individual. A 63-year-old grandmother in San Diego took that data, played a Facebook game, where she could compete with her friends on how she could save money on her energy bill in the hot month of August in San Diego, cut her bill 30% without a change of law. We didn't merge utility systems. We didn't re-regulate the PUCs. But by opening up the data, all of a sudden, now an entrepreneur said, I'm going to hire a bunch of, uh, uh, in this case, it was stay-at-home moms. I'm going to write, I'm going to pull all the tariffs, this, the time of use pricing you're describing, from every state PUC in America. And now this database of hundreds of thousands of very peculiar rules are in a computer system such that the weekend after they released this data and he had this thing, uh, an entrepreneur came up with a program called WattQuiz. And in WattQuiz, if the individual shares their energy consumption historical data with this app, it says here's the time of rate plan you should choose that could lower your energy bill 25%. Built in a week, with no government funding, just because we made the principle of opening up the data. 
Now let's talk about civics. One of the most democratizing principles of, of our open education philosophy is that rather than one dean dictating that this is the one curriculum to rule them all, what if every teacher in America could post, just like they can share YouTube videos and, and Facebook posts, what if they could post their lesson plans, but standardized in America what the educational content, they call this metadata, what is it that this particular lesson plan is meant to cover? So imagine an education internet on top of the internet. At no cost to the taxpayers, Arnie Duncan announced the learning registry, an open, lightweight method for any teacher anywhere in America, higher ed or otherwise, to take their lesson plans or learning materials, videos, whatever, maybe that archive at the Constitution Center, and upload it to this education internet. So if I could say, show me all lesson plans that teach Mr. Jefferson such and such, then I can pull all of the content that's there and a third party application developer can say, I'm gonna curate across all of those tagged items and I'm gonna show you ratings and reviews and I'm gonna provide recommended playlists so you could say, show me a civics program that works really well for Hispanic majority classrooms under the age of 10. And that, uh, Justice Breyer, is now technologically enabled because the role of government there was just to get consensus on the standard. So now that everybody, if you're a startup or you're a big company, you can publish your content to this lightweight standard and it's searchable and discoverable. So my hope is that if you diagnose the problem you're trying to solve into its core essential parts, and you say, what is the modest and well-defined role of government? Uh, Inevitably, it'll have this open innovation frame. We can execute against that without changing huge political upheaval to force the states to do time of day pricing, which we had a smart grid report. The president said, look, we got to move in this direction, visionary thing. But at the end of the day, what happened today? After that three CIO agreement, I think we're now over, and Amy, you might know from Todd, Todd, my successor, kind of took this on steroids. We're now up to 100 million Americans get their energy from a utility who's voluntarily pledged to adopt that same green button standard. So Anish, uh, John Teer. Is he here tonight? Yes. Yeah. John, am I right? What's the number? 100 million people. Right. I was right. 60 million households. 60 million households. I'm going to buy your book. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. Sorry, just to, no to conclude. And John, how many FTEs at the Department of Energy Commerce are doing this? Is like oh, a 10, 20? Less than, I would think it's probably five people that are really poor. Five people <laughs> have convinced utilities that serve 60 million households and 100 to voluntarily agree to this standard. And we work, we work really hard. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> That's the connective tissue between the Internet of Things and policy that we hope to see on steroids. And, and I think the only, the, you mentioned open innovation. I think what the Internet of Things is, is going to allow is something called permissionless innovation where you don't need to ask permission to innovate. No one asked no one, no one asked anybody to create YouTube or to create Facebook or whatever. They did it, right? To create social networks and things. They just did it. And I think the Internet of Things is going to allow us to do that across a number of different areas and not ask, you know, I like open innovation. I also like this idea, just permissionless. Go and innovate. Don't ask anybody, just go and do it. And I think that a couple of things, to, and, and um, um, the Internet of Things, <laughs> You should have brought your Arduino. Joe's carrying around an Internet of Things in his backpack here. Um, and and um, uh, kids can start to write applications for it. We see it next, uh, uh, no, tomorrow at the Maker Fair or on Wednesday, Wednesday. At, at the White House Maker Fair. We're going to see what kids are building out of these things. We had, sorry, at, at Smart America, we had an 11th grader who built an exoskeleton. He said he, he, he was sitting in that his room. That means it's the Iron Man outfit. Yeah. yeah, he was sitting in his room. He saw Iron Man. He said, I'm a little bored. I'm going to build Iron Man. And this 11th grader went and did it. He didn't ask permission. He just found the pieces, parts. He started putting it together. And he started to do it. And, and I am supremely excited by that. He that can't thing. fly yet. <laughs> just give him another year. Yeah, next year. Next right. year we have like, uh, let's do rapid fire. Do you have yeah. a question? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a humble student tonight, but I was wondering, grant me being biased by my own profession, um, obviously the Internet of Things is something which is basically targeted to the, how should I put it, the welfare of community in the broadest sense of the word. Uh, how about defense, and you did mention defense, how about uh, the threats which any 
government in this world needs to face, like cyber, like uh, terrorism, again, in the broadest sense of the word. Would that in any way be usable, transportable to uh, the, more, the more challenging sphere of uh, defense question. and Our security? Um, yeah, we did a number of defense-related projects, a lot of them around invisible perimeters. So being able to drop things out of airplanes and, and know uh, what kind of things are moving across perimeters without actually setting up fences or borders. Um, primarily so you know what kind of response to get, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need to send out the tanks and the guns if it's a guy with his dog walking you know, at night or something, right? So there was a, a lot of effort placed on like classification. Can we remotely classify without people having to be there? What's going on in different regions? And is it actually a threat? Do we even want to invest our effort or our time on it? Um, so there, there's a lot of that that's being done with the, the government contractors, North of and Lockheed, and so forth. Um, there was a, a project, uh, it's kind of scary actually, I think, but um, where they would actually put um, sensors into bombs to determine what kind of survivors existed after the bomb exploded, um, and what type of, you know, whether there was civilians that were still around. A, a very creepy thing was Sandia did it, um, but they've been using a lot of these different so on the other hand, let, let's talk about using this technology to actually save <laughs> lives and soldiers. Uh, <laughs> so in my previous life, my startup, I worked with a lot of largest defense contractors. Mm -hmm. What they wanted to do was they wanted to put the sensors in the major artery road in Iraq and Afghanistan. I was going because, to pass the Iraq. Because okay. what happens is at night is, you know, people come on and actually embed IED, improvised explosive device, on the road. It takes only 20 minutes to put that in and go away. Nobody knows anything about it. And next day, when the troops go on with the, like their, you know, their tanks, whatever, boom, it blows up. So what they do right now is what they did right now, they actually fly, literally, go over 24 hours and actually see if anybody's actually putting anything on the ground. Instead, use this technology, this is a real story, they actually use this technology, the sensor network, and that's what they, what they call it, so IOT, IOT, put that on the, on the, along the road in the major artery. If somebody's digging something on the ground, they're going to detect it, vibration, and all that detected, and send it to the command center, they know exactly where that's happening in seconds. Yeah, it's the same so, idea as the the it's same idea using it, using it. Yeah, yeah, one, one, one of my favorite ones, though, is actually the Sri Lankan uh, transport uh, department uh, mm -hmm. put sensors onto all of their public buses. And the, re the reason they did this is the buses would go along in their routes and they would time when uh, acceleration would occur in the bus. So basically, they would figure out where the potholes were. And then when the bus would get back to the depot, it would upload you know, essentially when these disruptions occurred. And so they would actually go out to these remote you know, village roads and go and fix the potholes um, based on these sensors that they put on the buses that were driving around these routes, which is really <coughs> you to do a couple of yeah. 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 I think we have one more question. Uh, Jackie, why don't um, you take So I wanted to go back to privacy and security. Um, so uh, now I'm working on one of the, one of the um, uh, Smart America projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm I'm all I'm, I'm a complete fan, but now I'm going to be I'm going to I'm going to go back to the other side, right? Yeah. So my family is East European. They grew up in a time where um, privacy was an issue, and they left East Europe as a result during that time. And so let's talk about sort of some of the issues that could occur, the what ifs. Um, NIST, the data from NIST, I see that as. Um, Somebody can take the patterns of my behavior in my home and know exactly what I'm doing when, behavioral-wise. Um, I could hook up a sensor to my car right now and find out all the information about my driving patterns, and then my insurance company could get that somehow and then have Maybe my... they're asking for it. What? Yeah. They're right. actually asking for it yeah. and giving you a discount if you're good. But yes. Yes. Exactly, yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, you know, so there's all these ways that like it can it can intrude into your lives um, and sort of cross this boundary of, of what we would feel comfortable with. Um, you can you can break into a car right now and you don't need a key or a jimmy. You can break into a house right now that has an electronic lock on it. So where are the what's the pathway or thought process for precautions? Um, and how does the chicken and egg process sort of happen? And when are you um, over-optimizing? Because I see with rapid development processes, you just want to throw something out there to get it to work. 
and then kind of often deal with those other messy issues later. No, this is why you need to have a pipeline management approach so that you can thoughtfully test and then evaluate. My, my only conclusion is this is why President Obama issued the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights uh, in 2012. The framework was we don't today have any baseline principles of privacy protection on whether the Internet of Things or the Internet more broadly. And the headline, in my view, is that we shift from this idea of notice and consent. And that whenever you use one of these internet applications, there's like a, read this user agreement, and no one reads it, Justice. These user agreements that are written in legalese that are like three point font that are 20 pages, no one reads them. So uh, you want to move away from notice and consent, and you want to move towards permissioning the use. So as long as you convey to me what's the use of the data, and I have control over how it's used and in what context, that's the, that was the philosophy the president took. Obviously, that's something I cared deeply about. Now, it's not law. We think the Congress needs to act on baseline privacy protections in the internet economy. And, and that principle of uh, permissioning the use is probably the right architecture without getting into the weeds in every specific idea. Well, so, Mish, once again, you're, you're, you're right on. I mean, and the problem, I mean, we say privacy and security as, as though they're one thing. No, they're separate. Privacy is a policy issue, and security is a technology issue. That's right. And we try to, con we, we sort of conflate those together, <laughs> that we're going to solve privacy issues with technology, which we aren't. We're going to solve privacy issues with policy. Um, and, and along those lines, again, you, uh, the idea is, we, it, it's, it, it's interesting, they did a study recently and they said, you know, are, um, are, are people worried about the collection of data or are they worried about the use of data? And they're not worried about the collection of data, they're worried about the use of data. It's not, they're not worried about collecting how much energy you use, it's you, and, and it's fine to be used to, to be more efficient about energy. What, they do, what you don't want is, you don't want that, that information to be used to sell you more insulation or to be sell, uh, sold new windows or new storm doors or whatever it happens to be. So it's not about collecting the data and, and it's exactly, if we could figure figure out a way, and, and I'm hoping that, that we'll start to, to work on this now that it's, it's sort of coming to fruition. Um, how could you meta tag the, the data as it's collected on how you expect it to be used? The if 2010 we, PCAST Health IT report, yeah, is on that framework. If, if we did this ahead of time, right, then, then you don't have use. And I think the, the term I heard was, where there is no use, there is no misuse. Um, and, and I thought that was really a cool idea. If we could, if we could control the use of it, then we can control the misuse. Yeah. So Thank you. We're gonna wind up. Let's here. socialize. Yeah. yeah. You can socialize. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is. A, thank you all, panelists. And Yay. Yay.